What comes to your mind first when I say ticks? Blood. I don't know. Pizza? Actually, ticks are arthropod external parasites responsible for spreading infectious diseases such as Lyme borreliosis, tick-borne encephalitis and Babesio- Oh, stop showing off, you nerd. Ticks are arthropod external parasites responsible for spreading infectious diseases such as Lyme borreliosis, tick-borne encephalitis and Babesiosis. If you have no pets, you probably haven't heard of it before, whereas if you're a dog owner, you may be intimately familiar with it. In some areas of the world, you might say, I don't know about dogs, but my uncle had Babesiosis and died in a car accident. Babesiosis, a quiet nasty disease to be frank, is caused by microscopic single-celled creatures called Babesia. There are like hundred different species of them, just the ones we know about, and they all infect vertebrates. Some of them prefer horses, others like cows, there are people lovers and dog enthusiasts and so on. In this video, we'll focus on the Babesiosis of dogs, which is caused by primarily four Babesia species depending on location. There are more than four, of course, but the others don't see that much play. Scientists haven't even bothered to name some of them, because naming things is really hard. Why else would this insect be called Agracadabra and this one Carmen Electra she kiss me? The letter died out, by the way. Anyway, back to our topic. We also divide Babesia species into two groups based on their size, namely, you guessed it, large and small Babesia. Babesia need two different host species to complete their life cycle. The dog and the tick. What kind of tick specifically depends on the Babesia species. Out of the two hosts, the tick is the definitive one, while the dog plays the intermediate role. This means that Babesia only have sex inside the tick. At this point, you may be wondering how the hell do two cells have sex and which one pays for dinner and so on. Well, it's not that complicated. The sexual form of the parasite in the tick is the gamete, which has two types, not really called male and female, because even electron microscopy only reveals a difference of a top hat and a pink bow between them. When the two forms fuse into one, ta-da, single-celled sex. Uncomplicated and results in everlasting marriage. That's why all Babesia divorce lawyers moonlighted fast food joints and car washes to make a living. Later on, the new cell, known as the zygote, through a series of steps, divides into several sporozoids, agile little genderless cells, which get injected into the dog host during tick bite. Once inside the dog's bloodstream, the sporozoids seek out and gently force themselves into red blood cells, where they split into two, sometimes four, at which point they rip the blood cell clean open and move on to attack new blood cells. Blood cells die, Babesia multiply. Time and again, some of the parasites, instead of dividing, turn into gendered gametocytes inside the blood cells and stay put until, with some luck, a tick comes along and sucks them up. The gametocytes then morph into spiky gametes inside the tick and the whole process starts all over again. Because of this two-host system, dogs generally cannot infect other dogs directly. However, there are exceptions. Pregnant bitches can pass the parasite onto their pups and blood transfusion can give dogs babesiosis if the donor is infected. Babesia gibsoni, one of the small Babesia, has a history of spreading among fighting dogs during illegal dog fights through uncertain means. It probably has something to do with blood and open wounds and bites and such. But overwhelmingly, it's dog infects tick, tick infects dog. However, ticks don't become infectious right away after sucking up Babesia. First they need to detach from the dog, contemplate on the great mysteries of life for a while and advance to their next developmental stage. You see, there are baby ticks called larvae, they suck blood, molt and turn into teenagers called nymphs, who again suck blood, molt and turn into adults called well, adults. So if a tick becomes infected as a larva, it will first become infectious as a nymph. If it gets infected as a nymph, it will only infect dogs as an adult. And if it acquires the infection as an adult, then, well, that's kind of the end of the line. George, 
I think we're royally f Large type Papisia, however, have the ability to invade the eggs of female ticks and make the next generation of the parasite infectious from the start. So how does babesiosis manifest in your dog? After a 1-4 to four week long period of incubation, you'll usually notice your pet losing its appetite, becoming lethargic and sometimes feverish. But what's going on inside? Well, we already talked about how the parasite destroys red blood cells, this results in what's called hemolytic anemia. Hemolysis meaning dissolution of blood. So blood is lost, just like with bleeding, but there's no actual bleeding. Also, it just doesn't have the same ring to it. Tell me, do you have hemolysis? Say what? Now, in a lot of cases, the parasites are not numerous enough to cause hemolysis in a magnitude that leads to noticeable anemia. However, Babesia tend to alter the immune system's perception of red blood cells, which makes the body attack and destroy its own healthy red blood cells. Now, this can be massive. To make a distinction, we call this phenomenon immune hemolytic anemia, or even autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The shortage of red blood cells, if severe, will starve the organs and tissues of oxygen, causing fatigue, shortness of breath, organ damage, and eventually death. The debris of red blood cells, which consists mainly of hemoglobin molecules, gets in part processed and reused with the orange-yellowish bilirubin as the intermediary product. This tsunami of bilirubin will discolor the tissues, resulting in jaundice. Now, jaundice in dogs is not that apparent to the layperson, so there's no need to worry about accidentally losing your dog in a yellow room. Sherlock, where are you? Fur color remains unchanged and pigmented areas on the skin mask the yellow discoloration, so your best shot at spotting jaundice is on the whites of the eyes, on the gums, on the pale insides of the ears, and in the case of a male dog, on the surface of the p Oh yes, let's, let's just bleep out proper anatomical terms for no f***ing reason. And what's with that stupid black rectangle? Alright, that's more accurate. Now, imagine a cup of coffee, an espresso, dark brown, almost black, rich in aroma, steaming hot with a ring of foam on top. Mmm. Well, this is dog piss. This is what it can look like if all that hemoglobin and bilirubin get excreted into the urine. It's a matter of degree though, so light hemolysis will only make the pee slightly darker. Hemolysis and its consequences are not the only way Babesia can make your dog sick or dead. The presence of the parasite in the bloodstream triggers other pathological processes too, some of which we understand, while some others develop due to no idea maxima, a common phenomenon in medical science. These other manifestations are collectively referred to as complicated babesiosis, which is like a multiple choice questionnaire where your dog can check one or more boxes to indicate which organs they want to see fail. Liver and kidneys are the absolute favorites, putting lungs, brains, muscles, pancreas and heart into the runners-up category. Complicated babesiosis has a good chance of killing your dog if left untreated. With that said, it happens that papesiosis manifests in no symptoms at all, or in only very mild symptoms, with your dog just being a little more meh than usual. The severity of the disease is influenced by individual host characteristics and by the species of Babesia involved. Oh, and on the side note, Babesiosis is super dangerous to dogs that previously had to have their spleens removed for whatever reason, like a tumor, accident, illegal dog organ trafficking by lizard people or something. Once infected, a spleenless dog can die of the disease in a matter of days from the onset of symptoms. So how is Babesiosis diagnosed in practice? If the dog is presented at the surgery with fever, loss of appetite, coffee-like urine and a yellow discoloration of eye whites, gums and, in the cases of males, of the rectangle over the p**t, the veterinarian will consider Babesiosis the most likely diagnosis if the parasite is present in the area and tick bites cannot be ruled out. 
Routine blood work and urinalysis can also point towards babesiosis. For a definite diagnosis, you have to confirm the presence of the parasites, which is generally done in one of two ways. Microscopy can reveal Babesia inside the red blood cells, giving the cells this cool, sunglass-wearing look. It's a dangerous life I lead. Some sunglasses aren't that cool, though. I lead a dangerous life, too. Now, it is possible that there are so few parasites in the blood that they get overlooked in a blood smear. That's where chemical detection methods are helpful, which can pick up Babesia in the sample, even in low quantities. Alright, but how does one cure this nasty disease? Several different drugs can kill the parasite, but small and large type Babesia are not sensitive to the same ones, so treatment protocols vary from a few injections to giving pills for weeks. Simply killing the parasites is in plenty of cases not enough. We have to reverse the damage and support recovery. Intravenous fluids are given to prevent kidney injury, blood transfusion to combat severe anemia, and anti-inflammatory drugs to stop immune hemolysis. And, of course, in the case of complicated babesiosis, whichever organ failed needs its own treatment protocol. Overall, recovery and treatment lengths vary, but if caught early, babesiosis can be dealt with in a few days or a week. However, recovery doesn't necessarily mean the death of all invading parasites, especially not small-type Babesia. Dogs can become asymptomatic carriers and have flare-ups of the disease later on. This brings us to prevention, which in the light of what's just been said is a way better option than treatment. Protect your dog from tick bites, and don't make them partake in illegal dog fights, especially if the opponent has a yellow rectangle dangling between their legs. Regarding the details of tick control, check out my three-part series on ticks, but if you're lazy, here's a short recap. You can use spot-ons, medicated collars, or pills to protect your dog from ticks. Those products that repel ticks before they bite, as opposed to killing them after the fact, offer somewhat better protection against babesiosis, considering babesia can be transmitted in as little as 8 hours from tick attachment, a new study shows. Possibly even less. This is why you should remove any tick you find on your dog as soon as possible. But for God's sake, not by smearing them with whale blubber and powdered unicorn scrotum and whatnot. Check out my other video for tick removal tips. Vaccination against babesiosis, if available in your country, is also an option, albeit a less effective one than tick control. It reduces the severity of a future disease, but doesn't reliably block infection. Plus, it's only effective against some babesia species, and it doesn't protect for much longer than 4 to 6 months. And, uh, well, just in case you don't yet feel like rushing to buy one in a Black Friday-esque friendly stampede, it still could be something to consider adding to your prevention checklist after tick control in areas of high Babesia prevalence. Summing it up, Babesiosis of dogs is a parasitic disease spread by ticks. Babesia specialize in killing red blood cells, but may destroy other organs too as a side gig if they are bored. The disease can easily take your dog's life, or just stay asymptomatic. It can be treated quickly and easily, or not so much. Sometimes it takes a lot of drugs and a pretty damn long time to even come close to a cure. Like, come on, Babesia, make up your mind. Anyway, protect your dog from tick bites and they will most likely be okay. Now that's just vulgar. The technical information in this video was fact-checked by Professor Vuka Shadashek, whose name Babesia dare not utter. To be honest, even I am scared that I mispronounced it. Anyway, I thank him very much, as much as I thank Siva for their support. If you've made it this far, why not like, comment or subscribe? Or check out my other videos. I know it would make at least one of us happy.